Our humble collection of all the nautical bits and pieces had been assembled when a slip arrived in the mail to say the graphics for Mozart's Hull had arrived at the local post office. I was really excited to see how these would look after working with talented graphic designer Life Jorgensen on and off over several weeks on the concept. Departure was scheduled for the following morning so I raced down to pick them up and then spent the evening applying the logos so Mozart would look sensational for the planned trip to Watomba. Pulling out of our driveway, there was a surge of freedom in my spirit with the many hours of restoration now behind us and stepping out into the fulfilment of the vision. I'm planning to sail the east coast of Queensland in little bits, from the lower parts of the Great Barrier Reef and further north. This is wonderful, really clean and really nice. I think I can be comfortable here for tonight. Towns like Harvey Bay, 1770, Yapoon, Mackay, Airlie Beach and Townsville all give access to hundreds of beckoning tropical islands not far off the coast. Recently I tried to sail with some beginning sailors to Watumba Creek on the northern spit of Fraser Island but we were defeated by strong northerlies. This time, the weather pattern was looking more favourable as we set out, so I was keeping a close eye on how things were developing. If you are interested in the earlier trips to Fraser and Great Keppel Island, subscribe and click on the bell. You won't get pestered, but it helps to browse nearly 50 videos that I've created. My vision is to inspire people to sail and enjoy sailboats of all kinds. From time to time, I get a chance to take someone out for a sail. Maybe they've never sailed before, or perhaps they haven't even put their foot in a boat before. Not everybody has the same chances early in life, with parents and friends that encourage us into sailing. But there's a deeper why to all this. Starting Roslyn Bay Marina at Yapoon, the promised southeasterly is yet to arrive. The coral sea is glassy and the slight swell just outside is barely discernible. I have found no more suitable place to encourage and mentor others than on a sailboat. I have personally enjoyed and benefited from this kind of mentoring by some beautiful, authentic people. My journey began in earnest while learning to sail on a Tom Sawyer-like adventure down the Frasenau Peninsula on Tasmania's east coast. He continued while crafting a replica of the first wooden sailboat I knew. She is called Moonlight and her story is found on this channel. Then I spent two years at sea with my young family by my side, working as a volunteer amongst the poorest of the poor in South Africa, Mozambique, Tanzania, the Middle East and Eastern Europe. The fun of sailing and the challenges of mastering, and sometimes being mastered by, the elements has an uncanny way of stripping away facades and revealing our innermost essence. Important conversations happen in the lulls. Hello, Mozart. But the lulls don't last forever and it's well known that the challenges of sailing increase in proportion to the wind strength. The first five knots arrives as the merest whisper, heralded by a darker shade of coral sea azure. Conversations continue unimpeded, coffee can be brewed, and Denise's rum-infused fruitcake explodes on my taste buds. Ten knots spurs Mozart into life. She 
She's chomping at the bit, longing to show me what she's capable of. At 15, pure exhilaration is on display. Seas are virtually dead flat and white caps are becoming more numerous. The breeze is coming directly offshore now. The full main and the number one headsail are bloated with power. Conversation is now limited to me giving expression to my childish delight. 20 knots gusting to 25. There is a saying that if you're thinking a reef in the sail might be a good idea, then it's probably time to do that. The jiffy reefing makes the job easy and the reduction in power makes life more comfortable. The number one headsail is about 120%, so we're overpowered in the gusts. Reluctantly, I go forward onto the bow with the number two tucked under my arm, a little later than ideal. But once raised, everything is balanced nicely. The stronger gusts have her healing dramatically and my crew has abandoned me to the relative quiet of the cabin. Then come the squalls accompanied by stinging rain and an occasional 30 knots. I try not to think of the manual swages in the standing rigging now being tested for the first time. 34 nautical miles to our west is Bundaberg. If something breaks, that's where we could end up. Now there's more northerly than would be ideal. We're sheeted hard on the wind and a little mechanical assistance is invoked to avoid a repeat of our last failed attempt to reach Watumba. This time the strategy works and once enough ground is gained, we're able to bear away for a rapid transit to the mouth of Watumba. The tides were reaching extreme low, making the entrance to the lagoon impossible against the strong outflow that was marked by the dark amber mangrove stoned waters, contrasting with the crystal clear waters of Harvey Bay. We anchored in the mouth of the creek, which drops off rapidly from the bar, quite close to shore. At five metres, the anchor holds in the strongest gusts, and of course there are no waves at all to contend with. The channel descends to around 20 metres, so we definitely do not want the anchor to drag at all. By now, it was around 3 p.m., and having set out from our overnight stop at 4.30 a.m., we were both tired and keen to get our camp set up at the T-Bone camping area before dusk set in. As the outflowing stream began to wane, we had a failed attempt at gaining entry to the lagoon. Shortly after, a second attempt allowed me to walk Mozart in an undignified fashion over the bar, being careful not to step on one of the numerous rays that frequent that area. Once inside the bar, it was a fairly simple matter to navigate the well-marched but shallow channel around to the campsite at Tibung. The incoming tide fills the lagoon to the brim. It climbs up the bank a full 10 feet. Mozart wrestled impossibly with her bow and stern anchors as the current dragged her sideways in one direction or another. As the water level then falls dramatically, it reveals a steep embankment of snow white sand. I stood a full 10 feet above Mozart, admiring the artwork emblazoned on her topsides in cherry red, with three dancing quavers in blues and yellow. Not far from the edge, a large eagle ray with demonic eyes and a menacing tail rested in a hole that he had made in the sand. Motionless at first, and then beating a hasty retreat into the murky amber brew. I was so glad I hadn't stepped on one of these as I walked Mozart over the bar. Once fully drained, the sand flats take on the appearance of a moonscape, pockmarked by countless ray depressions. Fine white silica sand is deposited as a fluffy overlay on the hard base, leaving ankle deep depressions behind as I make my way down the western side of the spit. The bay is yet to be ruffled by the breeze, and those yachts that have anchored in the lee of the spit seem to suspend it in time and space.
The tide is beginning to rush in. It has to rise a full 10 feet before the lagoon will be filled to the brim with pristine water from the bay. I'm not the only animal leaving footprints in the soft sand. The lone dingo has made his way along the narrow spit. He's heading in the direction of our camp. Normally I would be carrying a stick to ward off dingoes, but I would not thought to bring one with me on this occasion. Denise had not seen the animal, but he was not far from us and aware of our movements. Alert and observant, an opportunist, hoping for some morsel that would be left behind from our breakfast or even something cast his way. We're careful to keep all our food and rubbish secure. There will be no windfalls for the dingo this day. The odour of crispy bacon and eggs crackling in the pan drifting across the clearing seems cruel. You are the summer, we were the tide, the clearest of azure, bright as your eyes, golden skin sundress, you were the sky. He soon tires of the waiting game and breaks cover to skirt our camp, returning to his search for morsels such as crabs or perhaps even a stranded fish on the tidal flats. His colouring is a little unusual, cream and grey, blending into the more common amber coat typical of his species. He seems cut and pasted onto the brilliant white backdrop. Brilliant white beach just stretches for miles and miles up the coast. You can see in the far distance is Sandy Point, which is the very northernmost point of Fraser Island. Out there in the bay, quite soon we'll see the whale watching tourists come up the bay. There's about probably half a dozen boats that come up here, and we're hoping to even see some whales. The sand spit separating the lagoon from the bay is a very na narrow slither of land, perhaps only 20 metres wide in places. This makes an ideal bivouac, a temporary camp without tents or cover, used by fishermen. From this base they're able to fish the bay and the lagoon with ease depending on the weather and whatever happens to be biting at the time. The world makes us fly by into the grey Every season, every change You'll be the sunlight, I feel I'm a face We have a six hour sail ahead of us back to Harvey Bay if the weather conditions are suitable. The forecast is 15 knots from the northeast. We strike camp at first light and stow everything securely in case we get a repeat of the strong winds experienced on the way up the bay. The first signs of wind are already beginning to ruffle the surface of the lagoon. A fully high tide makes it possible for us to exit anywhere across the bar. Once underway, we see the early whale watching tours in the distance. They're waiting in the path of approaching humpbacks, putting on a tremendous display of breaching for their paying guests. 
they're way too far out for us to join them. So we hoped for some action closer in, and we were not disappointed. A mother and calf soon approached, and I guess from their coloration they are a species other than humpbacks, perhaps minkies which are also known to breed here in Harvey Bay. There are no aerobatics as they glide by within 20 or 30 metres. Too close for my liking, despite my efforts to manoeuvre out of their way, they seem curious. They don't seem to understand the rules about keeping a healthy distance. On this occasion, they glide by quietly, mostly seen as two vague shadows, one large and one smaller, creating an oily slick on the surface. We're heading south back on our way back from Mutumba, heading back towards Harvey Bay. And the southeasterly that's been blowing has pretty much dropped out now. The forecast is a northeasterly on the way, which will take us into Harvey Bay at, an, at a reasonable clip. We're still waiting for the northeasterly that they've forecast to come in. Southwesterly that we had, what there was of it, has now disappeared pretty well and it swung around a bit to the west. So it's on the way around. So pretty soon behind us there we'll see a dark shadow approaching us across the water and that will be the northeasterly coming in. I've shaken the reef out of the main and I've put up the the uh, big number one jib in anticipation of a nice brisk sail back across Harvey Bay to Urangan. You are the summer, we were the tide, the clearest of azure. Bright as your eyes, golden skin sundress, you were the skies. And I see the color I've known all my life. We are timeless. We are timeless. Waves washing over. Once entering the marina, it's easy to miss the final turn into the boat ramps with the westerly sun in your eyes. So we ended up taking the scenic route home. We had drifted under sail, motored and motor sailed the 40 nautical miles south without much wind assistance at all to arrive at Roslyn Bay Marina nine hours after setting out from Watumba Creek. As we motored across the bar, I contemplated what might have happened in a following sea in 15 knots. I'll be seeking out some local knowledge on that for the next time because I think it would be difficult to negotiate in a trailer sailor. When nights last forever and days run away, the world makes us fly by into the grave. Rather than hit the road, for home straight away after a long day sailing, or should that be motoring, we decided to stay the night at Shady Grove B&B. We enjoyed meeting Peter and Suzanne and we were impressed with their warmth and hospitality. If you're up that way and looking for a pleasant evening, you can find them on booking.com. Susan here from Shady Grove Bed and Breakfast. Welcome to our palace. <laughs> Thank you. It's a nice way to finish our trip up to uh, Watumba Creek. 